Lord, we just thank you so much. In Jesus' name, amen.
this morning, like if you need healing, could you just put your hands out this morning? I just feel like there's an opening. We've just been singing like, I see heaven invading this place. Like let your angels be released. And I feel like that there are like specifically like angels of healing this morning. Um, so if you need healing, why don't you just hold out your hands in front of you. And maybe if there's somebody around you that has their hands out, you can just like ask them, maybe gently lay your hand on their shoulder. But I feel like we're just gonna keep singing. We're not even gonna pray. We're just gonna like sing. And I just feel like there's ministering angels here to bring healing and we're just gonna leave some space. We're just gonna keep singing. And you know, if you've got somebody next to you, just maybe gently put your hand on them, but we're not even gonna pray or anything. We're just gonna let it happen. So we give you praise and all of the honor. You are our God, the one we live for. We give you praise, all of the glory, God. We give you praise.
like a little bit better. A little bit? Doesn't matter. It's better. Come on. Okay, so if you need healing, just stretch out your hands again. <laughs> I love that we didn't even have to do anything. We just held our hands out. You know what I mean? It's so amazing. So if you need healing, just hold out your hands again. Wow. And we're just going to play for a minute and just let the music do its thing. Let the angels do their thing. <laughs> so Holy Spirit, would you please just keep coming. Just keep coming this morning. We're so thankful for what you've already done this morning. We're so thankful for who you are. Wow. We love your presence.
would be actually a perfect time for us to transition into communion. So if the ushers would come forward and get ready for that.
can we thank Jesse and the team? This is awesome. Thank you guys so much. Wow. That was a rough landing. <laughs> Good morning, I'm Shannon McLaird. I'm one of the pastors on staff here at Grace Center. We just wanna welcome you guys here. We're so happy you're, you're here with us and we just wanna say hey to the people watching online. We're glad you're with us. <sighs> um, we'd like to, uh, whoa, I'd like to get my brain back right now. Thank you, Lord. We're gonna transition into a time of uh, receiving our tithes and offerings. And um, we like to declare things over our money so that we tell it, it doesn't tell us how we should live. And so if you guys would um, stand up and join me, we're going to do some declarations. Go ahead and speak this with me. As we pray for new wells of revival, we pray for new economic wells in our cities to be created. So, Lord, we ask you for favor for our city with CEOs, government leaders, and kings, manufacturing firms that produce goods for the nations and provide new jobs for our people, technology to establish new markets, energy sources, and efficient solutions to grow as a population laws and courts that measure with the justice and the freedom of your kingdom, civil servants that encourage entrepreneurs, media known for wisdom and truth, natural resources released, harvested, sold, and reproduced, education, books, and universities to develop godly mind molders who influence the influential. Capital to build small businesses that provide services, arts, and culture, attracting both young and old. Medical community known for integrity and excellence. Repentance from poverty, small thinking, and envy. Courage to recognize opportunities and make wealth. Abundance to bless the world and the prudence to save and invest. Revelation to pass on wealth to our children's children. Thank you, Lord, for meeting all of our financial needs that we may have more than enough to give into the kingdom of God and promote the gospel of Jesus Christ. Amen. Um, so as the ushers are passing the bags, um, will you guys just turn your attention to the screen and check out our video announcements? Good morning, Grace Center. We're so glad that you're here with us today. If you're a first time visitor, welcome. If you have any questions or need help with directions, look for people wearing a Grace Center badge and they will be happy to help you. Dad Me is an overnight camping adventure with Dad on June 3rd to the 5th at Long Mountain. This is a great opportunity for dads to bond with their kids over activities like a ropes course, a zip line, tree swing, games, hikes, canoeing, fishing, capture the flag and more. Tickets include the cost of activities, supplies for the camp, meals, and s'mores, and can be purchased now at gracecenter.us. Our annual Moore Conference is just three weeks away. Joining us on May 20th and 21st will be Jesus Culture Worship Leader Chris McClarney and Danny Silk from Bethel Church in Redding, California. Tickets are now on sale at gracecenter.us. This one's for all the guys. You're invited to our monthly men's meeting on May 15th at 5 p.m. We have discovered that for the most part, men have been left on their own to try to figure out life and to write their own life's map without much help. We are convinced that the only way to navigate this journey as men is to connect with each other on a more authentic level. When we have the freedom to share life's triumphs and disappointments, we discover together that we are not alone, but we are all sons learning to relate to our Heavenly Father, even in our imperfections. And we can be free to be who we were created to be. So, we hope to see you on the 15th. A suggested donation of $5 will be collected at the door. Register at gracecenter.us. Our spring Wednesday night classes are starting on May 4th. AJ Jones will be teaching her class on Sonship, which you may remember from her teachings on Sonship in March. In this four-week study, we will be taking an in-depth look at the five stages of Sonship and will learn how to identify where we may be stuck and how we can continue to mature in Sonship. 
In Couples Connection, led by Mike and Phyllis Best, couples will learn how to grow their heart connection, spiritual connection, physical connection, and community connection. In Healthy Living with our chiropractor friend, Dr. Ronson Dykstra, we'll learn the habits of healthy lifestyle that will help us to steward our bodies well. Then, on June 1st and June 8th, we will have a special two-week class on creativity taught by Ray Hughes. Ray has traveled the world for over 40 years as an author, storyteller, songwriter, and poet. Find more details about classes and register online at gracecenter.us. Are you interested in the School of Supernatural Life? Applications for the 2016-2017 school year for the School of Supernatural Life are open through June 15th. To apply, go to gracecenter.us slash school. We are sending a team to our adopted African village of Shweba this August. The deadline to apply for this trip is today. On the trip, we will minister to children, connect with leaders, and build bridges between Grace Center and our family across the world. Apply today at gracecenter.us slash Shweba. Check your bulletin to learn about all the upcoming events at Grace Center. You can also sign up for our weekly email newsletter on the homepage at gracecenter.us. Just a reminder that the National Day of Prayer is this Thursday, May 5th. Take a look at the handout that you got this morning to join thousands in praying for our nation and our leaders. Also, this Tuesday, May 3rd, Franklin Graham will be at the Legislative Plaza with the Decision America Tour. To learn more, check out this video. For 2016, I'm traveling to all 50 states to hold prayer rallies, calling our nation to God. We're calling it the Decision America Tour. We're asking people to pray, to vote, and engage in your community. I hope all of you churches will join me for the Decision America Tour where we're going to be on the Capitol steps praying for our country. Because if the Church of Jesus Christ would take a stand, then I believe we have hope for America. Well, well, well. Wow, there's, was that a, a long uh, video, Ness? But that, there's a lot going on here, uh, church. So uh, anyway, hey, good morning. Good to see everybody. Uh, are there any visitors, first-time visitors? Just raise your hand. There's $100 in it for you if you, if you do. People <laughs> 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 raising two hands. <laughs> welcome, welcome, welcome. Hey, uh, along those lines, if you would, Grace Center, if you would, let's stand up just for a second and turn to the people behind you, in front of you, beside you, and just say good morning. <clears throat> Introduce yourself. Okay. <clears throat> All right.
Good. Good. I uh, <clears throat> kind of cutting it short just a little bit this morning because we have a special guest with us, and I want to give him as much time as he as we possibly can. Um, a lot of you um, are probably not going to know who this guy is. Um, um, Actually, I didn't know who he was. Dick Joyce is here with us this morning. I didn't know who he was except apart from uh, Bill Johnson. I remember Bill Johnson coming here several years ago and uh, saying there were three people that had influenced their church, uh, probably more than anyone, and he named the names. Dick Mills was one and Mario Murillo and, and Dick Joyce, and, and uh, uh, I guess... Uh, what we had breakfast uh, last year because you'd come in and he's got family that are, that's in Nashville and came by and uh, so we just connected and I thought you know what next time you're in town I would love to have you speak here uh, anyone that's a friend of Bethel is a friend of ours and and I was just thinking you know probably the church that's influenced us the most across the years was was Bethel Church and so anyway so uh so Dick is here with us from all the way from, I don't even know how to, how to pronounce it, I'll let you pronounce it, somewhere in Mexico where uh, he lives and has been uh, a, a missionary for several years. But uh, if you would, uh, Grace Center, can we welcome uh, Dick Joyce this morning? Can you show him your appreciation? Come on. How many of you are glad to be here this morning? And how many of you are glad Jesus is here too? I told one church a couple of weeks ago, I am sick and tired of going to church unless Jesus shows up. And when Jesus shows up, fasten your seatbelt. Stuff's gonna happen. Anybody up for some stuff happening here this morning? It is a, a joy and a privilege to be here, an honor. And uh, how many of you, pa Pastor said, you know, some of you aren't going to know who this guy is. Uh, how many of you have never seen me before? Can I see your? Wow. Where have you been? <laughs> it's good. I want to come right to the word. My tendency would be to take five, ten minutes to kind of warm you up. Well, we're warm. You guys, you guys are warmed up. If you get any warmer, this place is going to explode. I want you to do something. Would you stretch your hand out toward where I am? And in that gesture, you're symbolizing two things. Number one, you're, you're saying... We bless the man that's come with the word. Don't know much about him, don't know who he is, but we bless him anyway. And secondly, I'm not going to sit here and passively listen to another sermon. I'm going to reach out. I'm going to grab this thing. I'm going to make it part of my life. So, Father, thank you for the richness of your word. This book can transform our lives, and I, I, I pray that as I speak this morning, anoint my lips, but beyond that, anoint the ears of my brothers and sisters. Let us hear your word for this hour. In Jesus' name, and God's people said, Amen. Amen. About four months ago, God woke me up very, very early. And it was still dark out. And as I opened my eyes, God said, I've got a new assignment for you. I put on my bathrobe and sat in my easy chair in my bedroom and, and waited to hear what the new assignment was. And the Lord, over a period of perhaps an hour, said, wherever you go, I want you to do two things. Number one. I want you to encourage my people to pray. And secondly, I want you to challenge my people to pray. 
Anybody suspect that I want to talk to you about prayer this morning? I need to ask you a question because I know this church is a church of the presence of God. And I know this is a church of, of praying people. But I do need to ask you a question. Is there anybody here that say, well, well Dick, hi, another sermon on prayer. I, 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 I pray so much. I'm so fanatical about this business of prayer that what I really need is for somebody to come to this pulpit and preach a sermon on how not to pray so much. Is there anybody with that, with that burden? Because if there is, I'm going to sit down and you're going to preach. I want to take you to an incident that, that's been pivotal in my own life. If you come to the book of Exodus, chapter 17. Begin reading with verse number 8. Make some comments and just, I trust that the, the Holy Spirit, his arrows will be sharp to my own life this morning and to yours. Then Amalek came and fought with Israel in Rephidim. So Moses said to Joshua, choose some men, go out and fight against Amalek. Tomorrow I will stand at the top of the hill of God with the rod in my hand. So Joshua did as Moses had said to him, and he fought against Amalek. Moses, Aaron, and Hur went to the top of the hill. Now, when Moses held up his hand, Israel prevailed. But when he let down his hand, Amalek prevailed. But Moses' hands became heavy, so they took a stone and put it under him, and he sat on it, and Aaron and Hur supported his hands, one on one side and the other on the other side, and his hands were steady until the going down of the sun. So Joshua, oh, I'm reading from a new translation. I never saw this before. It's a new, new translation to me. So Joshua laid low Amalek and his people with the edge of the sword. Anybody here would say, I want to lay the enemy low in my life. <laughs> Story's really simple. Israel had just come out of Egypt, and, and everything was going well until this day. And, and Moses looks off in the distance, and he sees the Amal Amalekites coming. These are a, a guerrilla warfare tribe that swept out of the mountains, attacked, plundered, then ran back into the mountains. And Moses knows he's in, 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 in some kind of trouble on two fronts. Number one, the Amalekites, in terms of, of, of the number of fighting men, were, were far more numerous. And secondly, um, in terms of military experience, they were, had far more experience. And so Moses says, I, 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 I got to do something. And he goes before God and he gets God's strategy. Anybody here that realizes that when you're in a mess, you don't need a psychological counselor? Come on. You don't need a better TV program. You need God. You need God's strategy for this situation. And so Moses comes before God. He gets God's strategy, and he comes to Joshua. By the way, uh, there's one verse about Joshua that says he was a young man. Do you know how old Joshua was when God said that about him? He was 80 years old. That encourages me. <laughs> I'm getting close. <laughs> he says, Joshua, I have God's plan for this. Oh, great, Moses, tell me what it is. Well, plan A, phase A of God's plan. You are going to go down into the valley, and you're going to engage in hand-to-hand -hand bloody combat with the enemy. Thanks a lot, Moses. What are you going to do? 
Listen to me now with, with not just your ears. Listen to me with your spirit. Moses, what are you going to do? I'm going to a higher place. I'm going to take some higher ground. Is there anybody here this morning that says, I want to take some higher ground for God? I want to live on a different level. I want to live on a different plane than I've ever lived before. So, Moses, Aaron, his brother, and her, I don't even know who her is. But the three of them go to the mountain. If I gave this message this morning any title, it would be this, Living on the Mountain of God. So the three of them go. And I don't understand it. Moses lifts his hands in the air, and in his lifting his hands in the air, something supernatural is released in the valley. Something that goes beyond most, uh, Joshua's intelligence. Something that goes beyond his ability. Something that goes beyond anything he knows. There's a supernatural factor released into the valley. I don't know about you. I am sick and tired of living life on the level of what I can do. I, 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 I'm sick and tired of getting by on my intelligence, my capacity, my talents, my cleverness. Something in me says, God, as the church of Jesus Christ faces probably the strongest crisis that we've ever known in the United States of America, we need God. We need the supernatural in, 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 in our society. Uh, when Moses' hands are in the air, I don't understand it, but something supernatural is released in his valley. But Moses got tired. By the way, have you ever gotten tired in prayer? I have. Aren't you glad? That when you get tired in prayer, God knows how to bring an Aaron and a Her to your side. That's why we have church, by the way. You, you, you hear often in, in our society, uh, well, I, I, I believe in God, but I don't believe in organized religion. My question is, what do you believe in, disorganized religion? You see, when you got born again... God put you in a family. And Aaron and her are there. And, and, and though his hands got tired, when his hands were lowered, by the way, the supernatural dimension was withdrawn from the valley. And Moses, or, or Joshua rather, is reduced to fighting the battle on the level of his own strength, his own ability. And because the enemy was more powerful than he, he begins to lose the battle. But back on the mountain, up go Moses' hands, a symbol that says, God, I'm reaching out to you. I, 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 I want something beyond my abilities. I'm, I'm reaching out to you, Lord. And, and, and somehow that power was released once again into the valley. And because of that, I love how this story ends. Because of what Moses did on the mountain, Joshua defeated the enemy in the valley. I love the Spanish version of this. Uh, we have been missionaries since, uh, to Mexico and Latin America since 1976. Uh, this is, I think, my second time this year preaching in English. Um, are, 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 are there any of you here that... How many of you don't speak Spanish? Uh, uh, wow. Uh, I, I, I want to suggest you start learning Spanish because that's the language we're going to speak when we get to heaven. <laughs> that, 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 that power, that, that, that supernatural dimension that was released in the valley. And in the Spanish version, I forgot why I mentioned Spanish, but I just remembered. In the Spanish version, <laughs> I'm getting old, come on, don't laugh at me. In the Spanish version, it says, Joshua plastered the enemy. I love it. Now, what in the world does all this have to do with prayer? Let me, let me try to give you 
three basic principles out of this story that, 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 that'll teach me, that'll teach you how to live supernaturally in the midst of your valleys. There, there seems to me three basic principles. Number one, the first one is this. Whether I like it or not, the Christian life is a battle. I don't like it, but, but, but that's the way it is. You see, when I signed my contract with Jesus 60 years ago, wow, I was 16 years old at that time. So now you can get out your calculators and, and you figure out that I'm about to celebrate my 50th birthday. <laughs> How many of you are better mathematicians than that? <laughs> 60 years walking with Jesus and the night that I signed my contract, I, I, I didn't realize what the fine print said. We used to have speakers that come through our church and they'd say, I, 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 if you come to Jesus, he'll give you peace. And I said, yeah, I, know, I, know, I need peace. That, that's good stuff. And then come to Jesus and, and, and he'll bless you and you'll be prospered financial. Give me, give me some of that. I, I, I need that. Come to Jesus and, and all of the good stuff. Not one speaker ever came and said, come to Jesus and you'll have the bloodiest battle that you've ever known. <laughs> As I said, I didn't read the small print. When you come to Jesus, it isn't just for a nice day at Disneyland on exciting rides. You, 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 you signed up for a battle. You signed up for a war. I, I, I said that in one church, and the pastor got angry at me. And in the office, he said, uh, I wish you'd never told my people that the Christian life is a battle. I said, why not? He said, we've got so many new Christians around here, we didn't want them to find out yet. I said, brother, whether you tell them or not, they're, 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 they're going to find out. There's a battle. You, the minute you signed your contract with Jesus, so to speak, you set yourself as an enemy against the enemy of Jesus. you got at least three enemies, and I need to hurry along here. First enemy that you have is, is the world. Do you understand that the the world is not your friend, the old theologians used to say, to lead you on to God. If you're a real Christian, and I hope, I hope you are, if you're a real Christian, you are a fish swimming upstream against the whole flood of the world. All you need to do is turn on the television set. You see what the world is... Somebody says, oh no, he's going to preach against television. <laughs> no, no, I'm not. Thank God for television. If it weren't for television, most Christians would be bored to death. <laughs> Do I dare? <laughs> I may never come back anyway, so I could say anything I... I can say anything I want. <laughs> that includes so-called Christian television. That often I watch Christian television and I say, what in the world does that have to do with the kingdom of God? It's the pretty girls and the pretty boys. Hoochie coochie across the stage. Jesus is a sweetie pie. Jesus <laughs> is a sweetie pie. How many know I'm not welcome everywhere? <laughs> How many know I'm so old now it doesn't matter anymore? <laughs> the, 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 the television, in, in the words of the Apostle Paul, the world is trying to squeeze you into its mold so that you'll think exactly like the world thinks. The world is, is my enemy. The, the, the second enemy I have is worse than the world. My flesh. Come on, don't, 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 don't look so sanctified. 
my flesh. And I'm not just talking about moral issues. I'm talking about the laziness of my flesh. I woke up this morning and usually before I open my eyes, or as I'm opening my eyes, I've made a commitment that I'm going to exercise the prayer language. The enemy, my, my own flesh, rises up and says, you're going to do that again? You've been speaking in that funny language since 1969, and you, you're going to do it again today? And I grab the Bible, and, and, and my flesh says, oh, come on. You've been reading that book since 1956, and it, 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 you need... You, You must have it memorized by now. Do you know what I had to do with my flesh this morning? Do you always feel spiritual when you wake up in the morning? Come on. Is there anybody like me that sometimes you wake up and you don't feel too spiritual? And what do you do? I trust you do this. You say to your flesh like you do for a little disobedient child. Whether you like it or not, you're going to serve God today. (laughs) Flesh is my enemy. And the last one, I don't even want to give him any airtime, the devil. The Christian life is is a warfare. and, And whether I like it or not, before I leave my bedroom in the morning, I better put on my gospel armor, so to speak. I better put on the blessed, blessed play, blah, blah, blah the breastplate of righteousness, the helmet of salvation, and go out knowing, I'm in a battle today. Christian life is is, is a warfare. Second principle out of this. Are you getting anything out of all this? Second principle out of all of this is simply this, that if I'm going to live a life that has impact for God, I'm going to have to learn to live my life on two levels, two dimensions, at one and the same time. And I'm going to have to do it in balance. You say, that's in this story? Oh, yeah. Uh, The first level is the valley. Joshua, you go down in that valley, and you're going to have a combat, mortal combat with the enemy. Bloody warfare. What is the valley? Your valley is the place where (laughs) it's your place of struggle. Your place, whatever level, whatever dimension of struggle that you have. It it, it could be a struggle with a a temptation that that you haven't yet quite conquered. And again and again and again and again, you, you failed in, in, in that area. And you see the enemy coming across the field and you say, oh no, here we go again. I love Jesus, but that issue, that, that, that could be your valley. One young man came to me and was pouring out his heart in a certain area that had beset him over and over again. And he said, Dick, I've lost every battle with that. And out of here came the word, son, you've lost every battle, but you're still going to win the war. The, the, the valley is perhaps an area of temptation that you haven't quite conquered. Or, or perhaps it's your marriage. Um, you do understand that uh, being a Christian doesn't automatically give you the perfect marriage. Uh, hello? Come on, don't look so sanctified. <laughs> My wife uh, passed away in May of 2010, went to be with Jesus. So I've been a widower for six years now. And we were married 37 years. And I have to tell you, in 37 years, we never had an argument. We had a lot of intense fellowship, but 
we, we, I, I said to one crowd, uh, my, my wife and I, and my son Ryan is here this morning, and he can testify that this is true. In 37 years, we never once talked about divorce. Murder many times. <laughs> but never talked about divorce. And it could be that I'm talking to some people this morning that are married, as one organization calls it, married singles, still together, out of custom, eat at the same table, sleep at the same bed, but there's nothing left. I'm here to tell you, God can resurrect that marriage. God can, can bring romance back in, into that, that, that valley. Whatever level, your valley is the place of struggle in your life. I, 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 I don't need to stop there very long. You have a valley. I, I, I have valleys in my life. But the good news is this, that as a believer in Jesus, my valley is not my only reality. I can turn my back on that valley. I don't deny it. I, I, I'm not an ostrich sticking my head in the sand pretending that problems don't exist. But I turn my back on the valley and I can rise into the mountain of God. And there on the mountain of God, as I raise my hand and I say, God... I need something supernatural going on in my life. I need something supernatural going on at my place of employment. I need supernatural help. And there on the mountain of God, something, there's a, a, a factor that comes into, the, comes into play. On the mountain of God, I thank God I can stand on that mountain and I have the privilege and you have the privilege of not simply, and this is the problem with most of us, visiting the mountain of God once a week or twice a week. And that's the danger of a church like this. Can I say that one more time? That's the danger of a church like this. That you can come here once or twice a week and warm your hands at somebody else's fire. You can hear the worship team soaring into the presence of God and get your Holy Ghost goosebump and think you can live on that the rest of the week. I don't know about you. I can't get by on a weekly visit to the mountain of God. There's something in me that says, I need to turn my back on my valley and I need to go to that mountain and not be, uh, as I said, an ostrich in the sand pretending that problems don't exist, but there on the mountain of God. What happens on the mountain of God? The Word of God prevails over my situation in the valley. The atmosphere of God prevails. Uh, uh, a year ago, a little more than a year ago, I get a telephone call from my doctor. I had just had my annual physical. And he said, Mr. Joyce, you need to come back to the office. <sighs> when the doctor tells you that, it's probably not to congratulate you on your good health. <laughs> and I made an appointment, went back in. He's looking at the chart, and he's very somber. And he said, you have a disease, all the tests indicate that you have a disease that's called hemochromatosis. And it's a long process, but it's inevitably fatal. Uh, can I tell you what my first thought was? Hemochromatosis. If I'm going to die, I might as well die of something I can't pronounce. <laughs> and he said, you need to make an appointment with a, with a specialist. So I go to the specialist a few days later, and the specialist is looking at my chart, and he says, well, you do have hemochromatosis. It's a disease, by the way, of the blood that destroys the liver and it could go to the heart and ultimately cause a, an instant fatal heart attack. And he said, you have this disease, but I want to do one more test to determine how far this has gone. Let me interpret that for you, how long you have. I went to the mountain of God. I went to the mountain of God. 
And I heard a word there. The word of the doctor was, this disease is fatal. The word on the mountain is, by his stripes you were healed. And if you were healed, you are healed. That week, I happened to be attending a conference in a small church, by the way, with Randy Clark. Uh, how many ever heard of Randy Clark? Great man of God. During one of Randy's messages, my telephone rings, and I saw, this is the specialist. I run out and, 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 and take the call, and he says, I don't understand this. Ten days ago, you had hemochromatosis. Wow. It's fatal. This last test indicates you don't have anything. <laughs> That's the mountain of God. I want to live there. I want to move there. In other words, I live in a valley where I have struggles. But on the mountain of God, I can put my feet down and I can declare... I breathe the air of heaven while my feet are firmly planted on this earth. Hallelujah. Oh, I got to hurry quickly. Are you getting anything out of all this? Christian life is a battle. But I can learn to live in the valley and on the mountain of God. I'll give you the last point. What I accomplish on the mountain of God determines my level of victory over the enemy in my valley. I want to run that by one more time. What I accomplish on the mountain of God will ultimately determine my level of victory in the valley. I pastored long enough to learn that principle. I pastored in Mexico City for 12 years. A group of mostly young people. Uh, by the way, our first year in that church, we were about 20 people, we had four young men healed of the AIDS virus. Medically confirmed. And word got out into the gay community. If we get there, they might pray for us. We might get healed. And I had some young people in that church that lived in valleys. And when they'd come and say, Pastor, we've got... One of the questions I inevitably learned to ask, it wasn't necessarily in these terms, how is your life on the mountain? Because the fact is, going to church once a week and getting a goose mump ain't going to do it. Right. The, 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 there's there's got to be something beyond that. Son, how's your life on the mountain? And inevitably, if they were being defeated in their valley, it was because they were being defeated on the mountain. Wow. I was a freshman in Bible college, and I remember a great man of God, Dr. Howard Farron leaning across the pulpit and saying, young people, if the devil can beat you in prayer, he can beat you anywhere. But if the devil can't beat you in prayer, he can't beat you anywhere. If I have no victory on my mountain, I, I won't have much victory, probably no victory <laughs> in my valley. If I have some victory on my mountain, and this is where most of us live. If I have some victory on my mountain, I'll have some victory in my valley. But the good news is this. If I can prevail with God on the mountain, there isn't a, an Amalekite on the face of the earth that can defeat me. What I accomplish on that mountain determines my level of victory in the valley. So the question this morning, I'm, I'm getting ready to come in for an emergency landing here. The question is this, how is your mountain? Uh, how, how much time <clears throat> did you spend this week from the time you walked out that door last Sunday morning to the time you walked in here. 
how much time did you and Jesus spend together on, on, on that mountain? Are, are, are you satisfied with the quantity and the quality of time you spend on that mountain? But more important is, is he satisfied with my time on the mountain of God? Let me share one more testimony, and I'm done this morning. Have you gotten anything out of all this? 19, what year were you born? 81, 1981, July of 1981, my, my wife was pregnant with, <laughs> it's hard to believe, uh, with, with him, Ryan. I had preached in a pastor's conference in uh, Saltillo, Mexico. And they took me to the Monterrey Airport, beautiful day. We lived in San Diego at the time. Beautiful day. DC-9, 69 passengers on board. As we came into the city of Chihuahua, there was a stop in Chihuahua, then on to Tijuana, where my wife would be picking me up. And as we flew into Chihuahua, suddenly a violent thunder, lightning, hail, wind. And as the plane was coming this way for a landing, a violent wind twisted the plane sideways, caught in a downdraft, and the plane crashed. 69 passengers on board. And as we hit the ground, the plane began to do 360 degree turns. Luggage flying everywhere and suddenly an explosion. And within 30 seconds out of the 69 passengers on board, 39 had burned to death in the fire. I don't mind telling you that I was praying in tongues. I'd, even though there were unbelievers present. And I stood, and as I got to the door, I, I'm, I'm staggering because my suitcase had fallen, my briefcase had fallen out of the overhead compartment, hit me on the head, I'm, just, I'm staggering. And, and, and the, the flight attendant in panic was, was screaming, La puerta no puede abrirse, la puerta, the, the door can't open the door. In the moment of impact, the mechanism in that door had snapped. And we were all sealed in that fiery furnace. <laughs> I can't explain this on the level of the valley, but I reached out. I don't know how to open an airplane door, but as I reached out and touched the door, it flew open. And I jumped out of that airplane and I ran, I don't know how many yards, and turned around just to see a huge explosion. And I stood there on a field somewhere in Chihuahua, Mexico, and I laughed and cried at the same time. I, 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 I wept because I knew there were people still on that airplane. But I laughed and I said, God, I don't understand how I got out. But as long as you give me life and breath, I'll crisscross the globe and I'll tell everywhere about the goodness of Jesus. Somebody say, what does that have to do with prayer? What does that have to do with the mountain of God? Here it is. About three months later, I was in Portland, Oregon. A woman came to me. And she said, where were you? And she named a time and a moment, a, a, a date. Where were you? I didn't have to check my agenda. It was exactly the moment that that plane crashed. Wow. And she said, I was standing at my kitchen sink, and suddenly a burden came upon me. Pray for Dick Joyce. Pray for Dick Joyce. Pray. She said, I, it was so urgent. I, I couldn't even go. I fell to my knees. 
And for the next 20 minutes, I cried out, mostly in the spirit, mostly in tongues. I cried out to God, not even knowing why. Where were you? The exact moment the Holy Spirit could somehow fly from Chihuahua, Mexico, to Portland, Oregon, and cause a woman to go to the mountain of God and touch the heart of God for me. I, 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 I don't know about you. That makes me want to pray. Yeah. That makes me want to go to the mountain of God. Everybody stand up. Every time I've preached this sermon a couple of times before, and every time I do, the arrow of the Holy Spirit pierces me and says, Joyce, you need to be more on the mountain of God. You need to be more in the presence of God. But what I feel I want to do this morning, just simply, I want to pray. I want to, I want to pray for you. <laughs> How are we going to do it? I, I, I don't know. Is there anybody here that's heard something this morning from the Holy Spirit that you need to make some changes in your life? Is there anybody here that says, I want to be a Moses. I want to get to the mountain of God. I want to have my feet firmly planted on earth, but I want to breathe the air of heaven. If that's where you are, make, make an altar right where you are, would you? Make an altar. Lift your head before God. Lift your hands before God. And just declare, Father, in Jesus' name, I, 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 I want to be a man or a woman of the mountain. I don't, I don't want to wait until life gets easier. I don't want to wait till there are no more Amalekites in my life because that time is never going to come. I want to be a man. I want to be a woman of the mountain of God. And so, Father, I pray. Here, here, I'm seeing a vision right now. The Lord... Almighty God is extending his hand down the mountain toward you. And he's saying, son, daughter, will you take my hand and let me lift you to a new dimension in God? Let me lift you to a higher place. Is there anybody here that says, I want to go to a higher place in God than I've ever been before? I thank God for this church. I thank God for the cloud of glory that rests on this place. But I don't want to depend simply on the cloud of glory in this place. I want to take that cloud of glory with me wherever I go. I want that cloud of glory to be with me when I'm at the office or the factory or the schoolroom where I teach. I want that to be upon me. I, I, I want to live on the mountain of God in the every days of my life. So, Father, I pray for every man, every woman, every young person in this place. I pray that we would take individually, each one of us, the hand of God. And let that hand pull us to a new level, a new dimension. I'm going to dismiss you in about 45 seconds, or at least turn it back over. I, I have to do this. This woman in the yellow, I think it is, jacket, during the worship, I turned around and I saw a word written over your head. And I don't know what this means. I hope it means something to you. The word, in fact, it was three words. And the, word, the words were, I will restore. The year 2016, the rest of this year, is going to be a year of restoring to you everything the enemy has ever taken away. You are going to get back from the enemy. You're going to receive from God that which the enemy has taken away. There, there, there was a, a period in your life, a specific period, in which it just seemed like every time you turned around, something else was snatched from you. It's going, not only is it going to be restored, you are going to receive a double reward, a double portion from everything that the enemy has ever taken away from you. I see three things that are 
activated in your life. Do, do, you, do you teach at all? Is there? Yeah. I, I see three things being activated in your teaching ministry according to Joel chapter 2. Wheat, oil, and wine. Wheat, the richness. You're going to have revelation on the word like you've never had before. Secondly, oil. The oil of the Holy Spirit, so that as you teach, it's going to be your words that you speak are going to be healing words poured into open wounds. I don't know what that means even. Healing words poured into open wounds. And the third thing, wine. Whoo! You're going to be the town drunk. You're going to... You're going to find that the joy of the Lord is going to so overwhelm you. Let me warn you, in the state of Tennessee, it is illegal to drive under the influence of the Holy Spirit. <laughs> and so there may be times, I'm seeing times for you when you're going to pull over to the side of the road. It's, the, the joy is going to be so great that you're not going to be able to continue driving. Pull over to the side of the road, enjoy the Lord 2016, year of restoration for you. Hallelujah. Well, it's, it's, it, it, it's been good to be here with you this morning. Um, let me just say, whether you like it or not, someday I'm going to come back to Tennessee. God bless you, Pastor. Thank you. The last thing you need is for somebody to come and beat you over the head and say, you need to pray more. I love what Bill Johnson says. I like a lot of things that Bill Johnson <laughs> says, but Bill, Bill and I go, go way, 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 way back. In fact, this guy sat on Bill Johnson's knee when he was just, you know, when you were maybe a couple of years old. Bill, Bill Johnson often says, God's in a good mood. <laughs> and the last thing I want you to take out of here, out of this kind of message, is the feeling, I've been beaten over the head, and if I don't pray more, God is going to get me. Um, we need to get beyond. I, I talk, when I'm pastoring at least, the three Ds of prayer. By the way, prayer is not just God give me, just hanging out with Jesus. First D is, well, that's in Spanish, beber. <laughs> it doesn't work in English. Debo de orar. How many understand that? Oh, good, good, good. You're on your way to heaven. <laughs> I ought to pray. Duty. That's, that's the word I'm looking for. Duty. I ought to pray. Sometimes it'll involve discipline. I don't feel like praying, but I know God has called me to it. But get to the third one, delight. We used to sing when I was young. How many believe I used to be young? We used to sing, Oh, the pure delight of a single hour that before thy throne I spend. When I kneel in prayer and with thee, my God, I commune as friend with friend. The delight of being in the presence of God. So I encourage you. You say, well, I can't pray an hour a day. Okay. All right. If you can't run a marathon, 
can you at least run one block? Hello? I'm talking metaphorically. See? So, I didn't come here to beat you over the head with the Bible. I came to encourage you. Be on the mountain of God. Amen? Amen. God bless you, Pastor. Amen. Well, we've, uh, we've got a ministry team that's ready, willing, and able. If you guys could come on down and make your way up here across the front, we'd love to pray with you. How about that? So, uh, yeah, if you would, make your way to my right, to your left, to the aisle over here where Mike's raising his hand, and we'll get you assigned to a, to a team, someone to pray for you. Anyway, was that good? That was awesome. That was great. Thank you so much. God bless you guys. I'm going to go ahead and release you. For those that need to pick up your kids, go pick up your kids. Have a great Sunday afternoon, and we'll see you next week.